of being guided by you. And we thank you for the journey so far. We thank you for the journey of your church in the city, the journey of, of your church around the world, that your church is growing, that people are coming to Christ daily around the globe. We thank you, Lord, for, for the faithful ones that have gone before us. We thank you for the Old Testament and the New Testament that um, declare your truth and this great theme of the gospel which runs throughout. And so, Lord, we're so grateful for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I don't know if you've been able to watch a little bit of Wimbledon here and there, but it's that time of the year, isn't it? Um, uh, Roger, Roger Federer is an extraordinary man, isn't he? Um, how do you think he's managed to do so well for, for such a long period? What would you say? I mean, he's incredibly talented, isn't he? He's, uh, he's incredibly determined. Um, he has a lovely family around him now. <clears throat> he's just a, such a dapper chap. You know? he's just, he just looks, he, he epitomizes um, you know, proper tennis. And especially at Wimbledon, all dressed in his white um, or as all of them are. Which I think that's what's so lovely about Wimbledon. But um, I think he also has a, he has a great team around him now, doesn't he? As these guys get older, they have this, this team of specialists which, which assist them in the journey. He took six months off, decided didn't do Roland Garros, and now he's, he's at Wimbledon doing, doing pretty well. Um, Proverbs 11 verse 14 says this, For a lack of guidance, a nation falls. But many advisors make victory sure. I think Federer is one of those guys who's taken counsel over the years. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. Solomon was a wise man, wasn't he, in most areas of his, of, of his life. Where did he? Where did he fall? Just one of those things. One's enough. So, his son Rehoboam, um, you might know a little about Rehoboam. I mean, having such a wise father, he, he followed, you know, in his dad's wisdom and the wisdom of God for a couple of years, and then decided, no, he would reject, uh, he would ignore the counsel of the wise, because he had access to tremendously wise counsel, and he listened to a, a young, hip kind of in-group of friends, and uh, went off track, led himself those close to him off track, and then ultimately led the whole nation of Israel off track, became a divided nation. I mean, just one generation, Solomon's, the golden era, and then the next generation, and Rehoboam's off track, with the devastating effects that divided a split, the slippery slide of corruption, sordid sin came into Israel with Rehoboam. And, um, you know, Israel was a lot like some South Africa, well, most actually South African rivers at the moment. Most, of, unfortunately, of our rivers are polluted. Um, there's a couple left that are really in good shape, but most of them are polluted. And that kind of pollution runs down into the sea. It's got all kinds of affluent and effluent in it, and it ends up in the sea. And Israel became like that. It was just this kind of sludgy, runny kind of rush. Everyone sort of going in the same direction. Majority rules. Um, you know, polluted, toxic, a sick society. And, um, you know, you ask yourself, where are you going to find somebody you know, that's going to start swimming upstream against the current? Who's going to be the Roger Federer who's going to look spiff, you know, and represent something good? Who's going to do it? You, you wonder who's going to change the tone. And, and today we, we're introduced to an unlikely hero. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 22, if you've got your Bible or your app, um, 2 Kings chapter 22. An unlikely hero, not, not the new Spider-Man. Have you seen it? No, no, that's not our hero. I don't even think Spider-Man can swim, can he? Wouldn't be able to swim upstream at all. But this hero swims upstream, this unlikely hero. I mean, listen to it. 2 Kings chapter 22. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. I mean, is that even legal? Are you allowed to become king at eight years of age? 
And he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. His mother's name was Jedidiah, daughter of Adiah. She was from Bozkath. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. David wasn't his real father. He was kind of the father in, in the faith, the father who did things right. Not turning aside to the right or to the left. Why is he such an unlikely, unlikely hero? Because, I mean, the, the whole society, his old man has gone astray. His, his grandfather, you know, went astray. Only his great-great-grandfather, who was Hezekiah, was a, was a resolute guy who walked in the way. So there's no reason why Josiah, at age eight, should follow the ways of God. There's no reason. Dad, grandfather, all of them went astray. And yet, from a young age, at the age of eight, why? Because he took wise counsel. He, for, you know, he, 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 he accessed the wisdom of God through others. His dad was bad. His, his, great, his grandfather was frot appels geweest. And he kom met die mooie appel uit, tussen al die frottes. Young, amazing. Age eight. Are we ever too young to follow God? Are we ever too old to begin to swim upstream against the stream, the pollution of society? Are we ever too young? Friends, are we ever too young? Are we ever too old? Josiah at age eight. We said goodbye to Douglas Crawford um, on Friday at age 91 to be 92 in November. A man who walked by faith. Hezekiah was his great-great-grandfather, a great man, but he didn't even know him. Um, Josiah really was a, a superhero in every respect. He was a super reformer. He reformed the culture of the day. At age 26, um, look, at, look at verse 3 in chapter 22. In the 18th year of his reign, so he was 26 then. Rob, I think you're 26. Don't feel the pressure. King Josiah sent the secretary, Japhan, son of Azaliah, son of Meshulam, to the temple of the Lord. He said, go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, and make him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Make them entrust it to the men appointed to supervise the work on the temple, and make sure... I'm sorry, and make these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, the masons. Also have them purchase timber and dress stone to repair the temple. Listen to verse 7. But they need not account for the money entrusted to them because they are acting faithfully. It's just fascinating. In this corrupt, polluted culture, there are some faithful souls who are looking after the cash well. <laughs> Which is unusual, isn't it? Israel's gone down the tube. The temple has become polluted. There's no real worship happening, but there are a couple of faithful guys looking after the cash. And they're hearing God's voice. And so, Josiah finds a few faithful ones looking after the money. And then in verse 8 to 10, Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple. I mean, that was the place they should have known, but they, it had collected a little dust. It was under a whole lot of stuff. They found the book of the law. It had got lost. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported to him, your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple and the Lord, the Lord has entrusted to the workers, the supervisors of the temple. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me the book and Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. Step one, friends, in reformation, in reforming your life and mine, in realigning a life, in beginning to swim upstream against the pollution of the culture of the day. That which has been neglected suddenly finds new priority. And in this case, it was the Word of God. Are you with me, friends? Could I have a little gentle amen? Just a... What was neglected now finds new priority. What has become neglected in your walk with God? What area of your life, what area of my life has become neglected? 
suddenly for, for reformation, for renewal, that which was neglected finds priority. So, what happened in the royal palace? Well, royal entertainment was set aside for a while. Meals were only fruit salad and water. You know, DSTV was cut. No series, no Facebook, no Game of Thrones, definitely. No gym, no Iron Man training for a season, let, let's say. There was just one priority. The Word of God was read, was listened to, was absorbed. Everything else, royal entertainment was shut down. The word of God, which had been neglected, took priority. One thing only, the age of 26, this king listened to and absorbed. Does this sound radical, friends? Does this sound a little crazy? Why? Why would this be important? Because God wants to use you to reform your world where you live and have your being, your little part of South Africa, your little sphere of influence. We can't leave it up to politicians, can we? Derek, just checking. No, no, God wants to, he used, he used Josiah from age 8 to age 26 for 31 years to swim upstream against the pollution of the culture of the day. Isn't he just a magnificent little guy? I mean, he just stands out. He just stands out and influences his... One thing only, your time, your talents, your treasure. There were the faithful ones looking after the cash. An unlikely hero was Josiah. Look at verse 11. When the king heard... The words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. Is that even allowed? Is that even legal for the king to tear his robes? I mean, I wonder where he did his shopping. Hey? Where did the king buy his robes? Was it, was it Edgar's? Was it Woolies? You know, was it Ackerman's? Or was there this private king's boutique? It was top quality stuff, wasn't it? The king's robe, the king's garments. But he shredded them. Why? For grief at the sin of Israel. His own sin. He realized the nation had gone astray. The book of the Lord had been neglected. Worship wasn't taking place. Step two, friends. and you know, It came out of this reality of reading God's word. And he, he personally supervised a major project, a project which could, which could not be delegated. We, we like to delegate this project as well. We like to delegate it. He, but he personally supervised it. Um, he had this grief, this repentance. He listened to God's word and then he put it into action. You go to chapter 23 of, of 2 Kings. Listen to this, friends. Look at this personal supervision of putting God's word into action. Then from verse 4, the king ordered Hilkiah, the high priest, the priest next in rank, and the doorkeepers to remove from the temple of the Lord all the articles made for Baal and Asherah and all the starry hosts. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley and took the ashes to Bethel. He did away with the pagan priests appointed by the king's of Judah to burn incense on the high places of the towns of Judah and to those around Jerusalem, those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and the moon, to the constellations and to all the starry hosts. He took the Asherah pole from the temple of the Lord uh, to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem and he burned it there. He ground it to powder and he scattered the dust over the graves of the common people. He also tore down the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes which were in the temple of the Lord and where women did weaving for Asherah. You're getting the picture, friends? <laughs> this cleansing that took place which you cannot delegate to anyone else. And this deep spiritual cleansing which happened inside Josiah became public. 
from the internal to the external, from the private to the public. And he went around and everything that was, that was anti-God, he began to pull it down. He began to rip it down. Courageous, eh? Courageous. People were making money out of this stuff. Big, big money. And he took it on one by one. Asherah poles, weaving, you know, male prostitutes, female prostitutes. Big, big money. Big stuff. Cannot be delegated, friends. He personally supervised it all. Personal cleansing became public cleansing. And you might say to me, Murray, well, you know, I ain't got any of that big stuff going on in my life. You know, I'm not, I'm not um, worshiping Baal. I'm not, uh, I don't have a, uh, a, you know, a temple to, to, to Buddha in my home. But friends, what's the standard of God's word? Um, when I was at school, I, I wasn't much of an athlete. I was kind of an in-between athlete. But every year, sports day would come around, and there were two profound athletes that would compete annually at the school sports day. And the one's name was Stuart Symington, and the other's name was Craig Wilson. And they would compete at high jump. And Stuart Symington, he was in my boarding house, so, you know, I would vote for him. Craig Wilson was in the opposition boarding house, so I never voted for him. But, but actually, they, they, were, they were both friends. But, he, but Stuart was tall, and Craig was, was, was much shorter. Um, and each year, the, the, you know, the high jump bar, it seemed to me, would be lifted. As, you know, as, as we all got older, they seemed to be able to, to take off and go higher and higher. I, I mean, I don't, know, I don't want to lie what the height was, but it looked incredibly high to me. And Stuart Simington being tall, you know, used to, used to come up and used to, you know, turn the back and fly over that bar. And Craig, he was much shorter, just seemed to have springs in his legs and would take off and sail. It just amazed me. The athleticism, the training, the skill. Um, so, friends, you know, uh, I, I could lower that bar and get over quite easily, you know, Murray the athlete. I could put it down at a meter and I could walk over it. And you could do the same. But the standard of the gospel, friends, is not at 1.5 meter or 2 meters or 3 meters or as high as the church or as high as Kilimanjaro or as high as... The standard, friends, is way up there in heaven. It's so high that all of us fall short, don't we? So when you do the inventory... When you do the cleansing, when you look inside, when you look at your attitudes, at your motives, when you look deep inside, you find sin, don't you? What's always going to be the prelude to reformation? Facing the sin in my life. Isn't it? And that's what happened with Josiah. Cleansing from the inside. You're still with me, friends. He personally supervise this project. You can't delegate this. I, I can't give my cleanup operation to Shirley. And it influenced the nation. The, the title of the talk today is One Life. Who will you live it for? Josiah Age eight. Are we ever too young, Al? Are we ever too old to start swimming upstream? Attitudes, motives, words. We're into the last home straight today. We're into step three. And he, not only does he knock things down, not only did he clean up the temple, not only did he get rid of public stuff that is, you know, in God's face. He breaks it down. He chucks out all those CDs that you shouldn't be listening to. You know, he, he, uh, he, he just breaks in there and gets rid of all that stuff. But he, he reinstates something. He reinstates something which told the people who they were. It told the people where they came from. It gave them identity and worth and value. He reinstated, he told them, who they belong to. 
You see, when we, when we forget who we belong to and who we are, we start living badly. Sin creeps in. The standard drops. We start accepting, you know, the culture of the day. But he reinstated something. 2 Kings 23 from verse 21. Just a few verses. Have a look at it. The king gave this order to all the people. Who's got it? What was the order? Celebrate. Celebrate what? Celebrate the Passover. Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God. As it is written in the book of the covenant, not since the days of the judges who led, is, who led Israel throughout the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah had any such Passover been observed. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. There's joy in that, isn't it? Celebrate. He didn't say, you know, just go around with a mournful face. Yes, acknowledge your sin. Acknowledge that you've gone wrong. But celebrate the gift of God. And what is that Passover? I mean, just magnificent, isn't it? Remember that you're, you're a product of grace. You're a slave. You're now being set free. Remember, I mean, they, 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 they passed over. Death passed them over. They should have died. The hands of the Egyptians. Death passed them over. God led them out. Um, you remember what their baptism was? Their new, their new journey into their new land as they went through the Red Sea. Their baptism from the old life which was over. Sin and slavery. Has God done this for us, friends? Should we be celebrating the Passover? We're going we're gonna to celebrate it right now. We're going to have an opportunity to, to, to do the, the spiritual check. An opportunity to have new life. Remember who you are. Remember who you belong to. You're a child of God. You're a product of grace. God loves you so much that He came and set you free from where you were and led you through the Red Sea into the promised land. We will, death will pass us over. Doug Crawford, his last breath on earth was his first breath in heaven. Hey. And he, he certainly wasn't a perfect guy. You know, Doug Crawford, when, um, when, when I got here, when we, we started working here, and, and Doug was here, was the interim moderator, 40 years older than me, me those of you who, who didn't know him, minister, loved the gospel, um, and, you know, I heard some good things about him, and, you know, this he'd done in the church, planted all these churches, and, he, you know, we chatted and we chatted, and, and I said, wow, Doug, it's going to be awesome to have you um, here. Um, I was really in his 70s, and he said, Okay, Murray, but before we work together, let me tell you about the other stuff about myself. And so we, we sat down. This used to be a little office just behind you. And we sat down, and, and he told me the other stuff about his life. And there'd been some really tough stuff, you know, hard, difficult things, relational pain and struggle that had happened in his life. And um, he looked at me, you know, sort of like saying, you know, are, are we still going to work together after all of that? And I said, Doug, well, you know, um, we have something in common then. We're both sinners saved by grace. So should we put that behind us and let's get on with the gospel? And we did. And we had great years of fun and serving together and life-giving ministry. Because we know that we're sinners saved by grace. Friends, do you know today who you belong to? Do you know that He's redeemed you, that He's got a plan for your life? You've come from slavery, your past is covered, your present is real, and the future looks good. Are you open today to wise counsel? Maybe in a time of your life you were, you were open to, to, to godly people, and maybe, maybe some of that's you know, been cut off for some reason. Maybe it's time to open those channels of wisdom again. Is it God's Word that's be neglected. You know, is it just a quick prayer here and there? Or are we really sitting and absorbing God's Word and then putting it into action like Josiah did, swimming uphill against the current? And you know, it's true, the world is polluted and it's true, there's a lot of corruption and there's a lot that looks bad. But I tell you what, Jesus took all of that stuff onto Himself. All of that pollution. You know, Wimbledon looks great because of that lovely white kit. Well, it's nothing compared to the white kit you're going to get in heaven. 
Nothing. I mean, maybe they play tennis in heaven. I don't know. But I tell you what, the white kit, the robe of righteousness you're going to receive, friends, it just doesn't compare. Would you want to miss out? Would you want to be in a place of unforgiveness or a place of hard-heartedness or a place of not doing the inventory check? Why? But around this table of grace, friends, around this table of forgiveness, and, and those who are serving, won't you come and, and join me up there today? What a privilege. Does it sound radical? Does it sound crazy? It probably does a little. But I tell you this, friends, God wants to use you to reform your world, your own world, and those you meet, and those you live with, and those you work with, and your family, he wants to use you. He used Josiah from age 8. 31 years. 31 years he stood against the culture of the day. And so friends, as we consider God's love, His grace and His goodness, you know, let's remember that you know, denominations and all the differences in the church were, ne were never God's idea. It was always one church, one faith, one baptism. We made all the other stuff. So, so this is one table of grace. One table of God's love for you. Perfect. His perfection for your imperfection. You know, our denials for His acceptance, all the, the pollution in our lives, the pollution in our country, the struggle, Jesus took it into Himself. Your unanswered prayers. Can, can, can God ever be wrong? His timing is always perfect. And friends, this is, this is the hour of God's grace. This is not just repentance. This is restitution. This is God towards us. This is, you know, this is how renewal happens. Right here. This is where it starts. Your life, my life. You, you cannot delegate this to someone else. And so, Father, around this table of grace, we come. The standard is incredibly high. The standard of perfection. We all fall short. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Friend, th th there is repentance required from us today. There are areas of our lives that do not measure up. There's your thought life. There, th there are words we have spoken. There are words we should have spoken. There are attitudes. There are motives. There's a lack of love. There's pride. There's ignorance. There's selfishness. There, you know, there's us saying, Lord, use someone else. I'm not keen, you know. Josiah from age eight. We are never too young. We're never too old. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I had also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And so friends, we take this cup, this new wine, and we take this bread, and we set it apart from its ordinary use, its ordinary everyday use to this holy mystery. It is a holy mystery. God's grace that Jesus would love us sinners so much that He would give His life for us. That we may live that death may be passed over 
we may live eternally. And Father, we belong to you. Father, we offer ourselves to you. Make us one in your love and ask of us whatever you will. And so friends, as we quietly sing and pray and consider that lovely prayer,